So uh, Warwick can't come and Dennis Baker couldn't come. So, and uh, I brought along a, uh, a visitor, Pavel Turk, who's just over in the corner here. He, like myself, is a B24 researcher and has about as, twice as many books, or three times as many books as I've written. So he's, he's pretty prolific. And he's from the, uh, from the Czech Republic. And we've been traveling around showing him the, or well, he's been traveling in the, in the Southern States. And uh, then he came up here and I'm showing him around Southeast corner. Well, sorry, five members answered the call to help out taking an opportunity to publicize the AHSA Queensland at the Queensland Air Museum. And Pavel, Pavel and I have just been up there taking photographs of everything for him. Uh, we've got future guest speakers. Uh, Peter Dornan is coming up soon uh, about Nicky Barr because he wrote the original book on Nicky. And as usual, no meeting on in December because we don't have one. And Peter, you were suggesting that for the November meeting, we might uh, dress up in Leary shirts Leary like shirts. you've got and, yep. and yep. hats or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Aviation. Aviation shirts like this, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, aviation themed shirts and, and hats and things if you can possibly. So uh, there's not nothing much more I can say for a moment. We need to have... Uh, there's one other guest speaker who, got, who accepted my invite I think it was last night, John, uh, Air Commodore John Meyer oh, yeah. is going to do, do be our guest speaker in February and he's going to talk about um, uh, RAF flying boats. He's writing a book on that at the moment. So, And uh, we're going to give the floor to Tom Lockley for a few minutes so that he can tell us about his latest uh, uh, project. Yeah, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Okay, uh, not so much my project as Seaplane Owners Association project and Michael Smith. But as you probably know, next uh, year is the 100th anniversary of the first, first flight around Australia by uh, Gobel and McIntyre of the RAAF. And uh, just a very early heads up, Michael Smith intends to fly around Australia uh, one direction, strangely enough, and David G is leading a flock of sea rays, we hope, We'll fly around Australia in the other direction to celebrate uh, the event. Uh, I've got one of my little books uh, published on it. Thanks very much, Dave, for the work you did on the photographs. It's very good. Um, and I'll put in the chat the um, website that uh, David Jess has established for it. But if you're interested in A, flying, or B, uh, uh, meeting the seaplanes as they pass around the place, uh, You'd be very welcome, uh, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. I'll put the uh, website address in the chat and people can use the blog there to come and communicate. Thanks for the opportunity of letting me talk. Thanks, Tom. Well, our speaker tonight, you should all know him. He's been here before. Anthony Cooper uh, has written some wonderful books. They're all in my library, by the way, Anthony. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to introduce... Anthony talking about Three Squadron. Uh, thanks, Bob, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, hello again. So, yes, I'm def uh, the, I have a book project which I've been working on for quite some time, actually, um, which is on Three Squadron. And um, what I do is I always focus upon the difficult years. So, um, the, the, typically the years when we're not winning the war, typically the years when our squadrons are undertrained and unprepared when it's difficult. If you look at all my books, I cover the difficult years. And so I'm focusing for this book on the first year. Um, Three Squadron is incredibly important to the RAF's history. Um, it's the hardest fighting RAF fighter unit ever. Um, more, more air combat, more everything. This is a hard fighting squadron. You know, again, I do books on hard fighting squadrons. I choose a campaign that was difficult where the squadron has to take losses. And this campaign I'm discovering, having already charted the history of several Australian fighter squadrons in the Second World War, I'm realising this is the toughest fighting unit of the RAF. Um, yeah, like the New Zealand division, it spends the entire war in the Middle East, unlike um, all the rest of the Australian units. Um, it's one of only two regular RAF units to go to the European theatre, the other one being 10 Squadron on Sunderland's. 
Um, importantly, this squadron pioneers fighter aviation for the RAF. The RAF has no fighter aviation prior to three squadron. We'll come, we'll come to what they did do in the interwar years, but it's not any serious fighter aviation. So if you think of the post-war RAF fighter force, it's a creation of three squadron. Um, and it's also, importantly, again, it's the seedbed of the RAF's fighter force um, on the Australian front in the difficult years of 1942, which is what my book, Kokoda Airstrikes, was about, amongst other things. So for a bunch of reasons, I think this squadron is incredibly important. Um, that's uh, Peter Jeffrey, who goes on to pretty well found the entire Australian fighter force in Australia. And that's Turnbull, Pete Turnbull, who dies at Milne Bay. Um, so their initial pilot carter was pretty thin. Um, it's a regular RAF squadron, so they're not getting any Article 15 pilots in this early stage. They will, but not in this early stage. When they go to uh, the war, it's top heavy with, um, with flight lieutenants and squadron leaders. They're people who have been chosen so that their war experience will enable their career to go on. They need um, operational experience. They need to be in a command role. And so they go with a, about six um, flight lieutenants and squadron leaders and only about eight boggies. Okay, so the, it's incredibly top heavy. The boggies consist mostly of guys who've been pulled out of flight, um, um, their, um, flight, their flying school at Point Cook. So they haven't even graduated as, as pilots. So um, the, the, they've been sent to three squadron before three squadron gets deployed. Three squadron ha has to basically finish them as pilots. Okay. And you can just imagine how inexperienced those guys were. The entire squadron, no one's a fighter pilot. They're all army cooperation. Everybody. No one's got any fighter experience. Um, they've got a few older guys, um, like John Jackson would be a good example, who's citizen of the Air Force. So he's he's not a, um, a an air cadet who's been pulled off course prematurely. He's um, a pilot, but even he criticised his flying. He said he was a really rough pilot by Air, uh, air Force standard because he was he's basically a civil pilot when he joined when he um, was was mobilised. Um, there's no one who's been to OTU. None of the flight commanders, not the CO, no one's been to OTU. So how, how you could expect this squadron to perform well in the initial period, you know, it's a bit fanciful. There's no reserves. So if people start getting um, eliminated, they've got no reserves to call upon. This squadron goes to your paper thin. Now, we all know about the RAF Short Service Commission. So approximately half of the Point Cook, Point Cook graduates in the 30s went to the RAF and they signed on for a short service commission. So we know about that. We know about the, the, the guys who went through the Battle of Britain and so on and so forth. There's some of them there. So that's the 65 Squadron uh, photograph. And we've got Gordon Olive. Many of you would have read his book, as I have. And that's Jack Kennedy. Um, Kennedy dies. They're lost to the RAF. So yeah, there are some RAF, um, RAF yeah, Point Cook graduates who have been trained in fighter aviation, but they're lost to us. These people have to complete their, their, their careers in their RAF. So when we create our fighter force in Australia, we've got to do it from our own um, uh, resources. So these are uh, that's just illustrative of the general um, era, okay? Um, three Squadron alumni, you know, were, were absolutely essential to creating that fighter force that went to New Guinea um, to defend Port Moresby in early 42. Peter Jeffrey, Founded everything. He moved from one unit to another, set each one up, set up the flight commanders, moved on to the next one. Incredibly important guy. We all know about John Jackson, Pete Turnbull, and Alan Rawlinson. Um, so uh, the two in the middle, as we know, uh, did not survive 1942. But it's uh, indicative of the importance of the units, the RAF. Okay, so yeah, we all know that the RAF did have some fighters in the war period. Yeah, yeah, SE5s and Bristol Bulldogs. But um, the numbers of these things in service, we had eight of them. So eight bulldogs, they crashed them pretty frequently. And so the, the fleet shrank. And so that line up there is probably in about 1938, there's four surviving airframes in the Air Force. So what happens to these aircraft? They, get, um, a, a, they, get, they go on strength of individual units, like two squadron, for example, and um, flight commanders take them for spin. They're used at air shows. Two flight commanders might do a one-to-one dogfight. 
It's not fighter aviation, not that not um, fight aviation by the standards of any professional uh, air force. Okay, so three squadron was not a fighter squadron, neither was any other Australian RWF fighter squadron in, in the interwar years. You might think the demon is a fighter. It's not. It's an Army Cooperation aircraft. It's replaced the Wapiti. And if you look at what three squadron actually did it, through the 30s, they did Army Cooperation. That's all they did. Um, as we know, the Wirraway, not a fighter. It, as far as three squadron was concerned, it's an Army Cooperation aircraft. And so they get sent to the Middle East specifically to be the Army Cooperation Squadron for Sikh divisions. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been sent. That's still like the political agreement that's been made between the government, the Army, and the Air Force. And that's well known. So we know that three squadron um, uh, flying, Australian Flying Corps did the same job back in the First World War. The pilots got there. They discovered that they were Army Cooperation, grown. And then they discovered they were going to be equipped with uh, light handers, double grown. There's two reasons why this aircraft was unpopular. It was a terrible aircraft. The trim, I don't know if you've read any pilot reports, like it's an incredibly heavily trimmed aircraft. So you got, you got it on final approach and you've trimmed all the way back. And if you've got to power up, you just can't, you know, you, you don't have enough um, authority. It's very, very difficult to fly from the perspective of Australians who've been flying a relatively sweet flying airplane like the Wirraway. It's almost impossible to taxi. It's incredibly hot in the cockpit and they're flying it in Egypt, you know? And most of all, but so it's, 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 a, it's not a nice aircraft to fly. Or oh, the other awful thing about it is the slats come out. The flaps and slats come out by themselves just based on your angle of attack. So the pod's got no decision about when he puts his flaps or slats out. So this, the, the damn things are coming in and out of the wing, you know, but the worst thing about them is that they're not a fighter, they're an army corporation aircraft. The pilots hate that. And so they get a conversion to fighters, hooray. It's, it's obvious to see why that was permitted. From the perspective of RAF Middle East, they already had two flight center squadrons, number six and number 208. Why would they want a third one? That's enough. They were short of fighter aircraft, not of army cooperation aircraft. Did not need any Lysanders, any more Lysanders operationally. Air Marshal Longmore, Longmore, who was born in Australia, interestingly enough, he was already, you can see that he was already reconfiguring the army cooperation role to be one of attack reconnaissance using fighter aircraft. So he, the, the, the doctrinal shift was already happening in his head. And also he could see when he visited the squadron that they wanted to be fighter pilots and they got agreement by the AIF in Egypt, by the RAF liaison office in Egypt, three squadron, the airboard back in Melbourne just have to catch up. And they did. So it was a local decision. And so the decision was that fighter pilots can do rec RICO. So the, all, the whole pilot carter had more or less trained well as Army Corporation pilots, so they had the skill. They had already got Army liaison officers attached to the unit so they could do the briefing and debriefing. Interestingly enough, within RAF doctrine, the only reason you have a backseat in a Lysander is to cover your tail. The pilot does the observing, noting on his on his, it's different to World War One, where the where the observer did a lot of work. One of the reasons being in World War One, the observer was an officer, whereas in the interwar uh, RAF, the 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 rear, rear seat guy tends to be an airman who's been tapped on the shoulder to fly, even though he's really a you know um, airframe uh, fitter or something like that. So that's probably the reason why they don't get him to do much. So um, they re equipped with Lysanders. There's a really quick operational deployment using gauntlets of all things. Uh, so a flight from uh, three squadron is attached to 208 squadron. And so they're the first Australian flight to be deployed in the operational area in the Western Desert. Yeah, RAF um, uh, Middle East was short of all kinds of aircraft at this period. So the gauntlet would have to do. And so while they were doing that, and they didn't do a lot by the way, uh, but while they were deployed in the desert, the rest of the um, squadron trained. Okay, so from the perspective of the Australian pilots, Gladiator looks like a step back, doesn't it? So you've been flying wearaways, you arrive in Egypt, and they say, here's, here's, your, here's your equipment. It's a Gladiator, fixed undercart, you know, um, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's a technological step backward, but it's a better aircraft um, in every respect. So as we know, this thing does about 200, I think, seven miles per hour, something like that, flat out. You know, this is 255. The Gladiator climbs at 2,500 feet per minute, easy. 
It's a hell of a dog fighter. It's an extremely responsive aircraft. It's got four guns. Um, it's got oxygen. It's got radio. It's really quite a modern machine. And the aircraft they actually had on service, they're new aircraft. It's not as if they were, they were built 10 years ago. They would have smelt as new as the Hurricanes did when they got into Hurricane shortly after. So it's not an old aircraft. The equipment, well, you know, it's, it's, it's lucky for RAF Middle East that they're up against the Italians because there's obviously technological equivalence there. Very similar performance, these two aircraft. There are some differences. The Italian aircraft doesn't have flying wires. Uh, they've gone for a girder truss um, arrangement instead. But broadly speaking, they have a very similar performance. So can the Gladiator take on the CR-42? Yes, it can. It's good enough. The gauntlet was used in an army in a army support role, basically dive bombing and strafing. Dive bombing using um, 20 pound Cooper bombs, pretty much like camels had in World War One. So not a great aircraft, but what were the Italians using for the same role? They're using CR-32s. So both aircraft, 230 miles an hour flat out, you know, very similar tactical characteristics. So good enough. Eventually we'll get onto it, but they um, we we uh, we get to be re-equipped with the Hurricane. And um, the equivalent in theatre was the Fiat G50. The Hurricane's definitely better, but this aircraft would have very hurricane-like tactical characteristics. It would come at you like a hurricane, very similar speeds when they're coming down from higher um, altitude, similar speed. It's got a worse armament. It is a bit slower. Most importantly for the Italians, it doesn't have radio. So the Italian, uh, they go to war with um, radio where they can only receive, they can't transmit. And it's pretty much like the Japanese in 42, both air forces just go, this radio gear, it's just weighing our aircraft down. It's unreliable, it's useless. And they just get the radio out of their aircraft and they, and they just fly with hand signals. Japanese do that, Italians do that. Okay, so another good thing is that we actually have RT that actually works. So the Hurricane's a better aircraft for sure, but from the Italian perspective, this thing's good enough. It's hurricane-like. The Australians found themselves in the early days up against 110s. Uh, we know these things have got a bad reputation from the Battle of Britain. A lot of that propaganda. And if you read some of the best books that have come out recently, you see that there's a bit of a rehabilitation of the 110s reputation. In short, it's fast. It's faster than the hurricane. And if these things come down at you from a greater height, you're in trouble, particularly if you don't see them. So it can, it can fight on the dive and zoom very effectively. Is the hurricane good enough? Yes, it is. It's good enough to catch them if it's at a height advantage. Uh, it's obviously out more manoeuvrable. And so as a matter of fact, the Australians do pretty well against the 110. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good. And then we go to Syria and we find ourselves up against this uh, D14, uh, D520. This is a pretty good aircraft. Um, best of the French aircraft. It's only got a 960 horsepower engine. They really need a 1200 horsepower engine in it, but they don't. But even with that horsepower, it still does 329 miles per hour. This thing, the Curtis speed figures are a bit unreliable. I would say dishonest. It's a one of the sort of backstories of World War II fighters, but I think 340 miles an hour would be correct for a Tomahawk. So the, the French aircraft's got a similar speed, but as a matter of fact, our Tomahawks completely dominated the French aircraft um, for other reasons, I think. And then, of course, when we get back to the desert, we find ourselves uh, up against the hated 109s. And they were just coming in 109Fs during the uh, the end of the year, during Operation Crus um, uh, Crusader. And um, we will find out this proves to be the nemesis of the Tomahawk and many other Allied aircraft. Turns out to be, unsurprisingly, by far the most formidable opposition the Australians had ever found. But the reason that they are fighters is because it's supposed to shoot down bombers, particularly with RAF doctrine. You've got to go for the bombers. That's the important bit. Both of these Italian aircraft aren't bad. Yeah, their their engines were a little bit um, weak. You know, you know, once again, you're an 840 horsepower engine in the Savoy. Uh, it's not really enough horsepower for that, but that's why they put three engines on them. It's old fashioned construction. They're basically both built like uh, Fokker tri motors, same constructional principles. So it's not really good enough technologically, but it is good enough tactically. The, um, they're fast enough that the gladiators can't catch them. Three Squadron also engages uh, and destroys quite a few German bombers. 
um, in hurricanes once I, once I get re-equipped. Re Lots of JU-8087 claims. I mean, this is a good aircraft. And if you read from the Battle of Britain period and also from Malta, even in 42, when they got Spitfires, a lot of the pilots complain about how fast these things are, how hard it is to catch them when they're heading off the target with their noses down, and also how hard it is to shoot them down. They complain that they're too heavily armoured. Three Squadron just shoot them down. They don't seem to have anything special. And they also shoot down French bombers, um, uh, the Leo 451, nice, fast machine. You know, If it was in our Air Force, we'd be pretty pleased with it. And, of course, the Martin 167, which we called the Maryland when it came into RAF service, good aircraft, uh, both better than the Blenheim, which was the equivalent role um, in the uh, RAF Middle East at the time. So decent bombers, three squadrons, shoot them down in flames in droves. These things are swept from the sky when they run into three squadron. It's a bit hard to, um, to explain. Okay, there's four campaigns, which kind of makes the squadron so interesting. First campaign... Uh, it's our Cyrenaican offensive, Operation Compass under General O'Connor. Uh, we're flying gladiators and fighting the Italians. Um, and then straight after that, now this time we're retreating from um, the, the um, from Cyrenaica. Rommel's after us. Uh, by this time, we're flying hurricanes and we're fighting the Germans. Then three squadrons get pulled out of the fight because they are worn out by that stage. Get rear quick tomahawks, go to Syria, fly the, um, against the French, complete that campaign. Um, retrain, get some more um, uh, freshly um, freshly graduated Article 15, um, you know, Air, Empire Air, Air Training Scheme pilots, and they go into the second Cyrenaican campaign, which climaxes with um, Operation Crusader, where we kick Rommel out of at least the first half of, of uh, Cyrenaica, and we're fight, flying fight Tomahawks, fighting the Germans. The reason that Three Squadron gets Kitty Hawk so early is because of the losses we suffer in that fourth campaign on Tomahawks. The losses that the RAF took in Tomahawks were so heavy, they're running out of airframes. So lucky the Kitty Hawks arrived because there weren't too many Tomahawk airframes left in the depots back in Egypt. Um, yeah, important people there, Turnbull, Perrin, Rawlinson, uh, all names to be reckoned with. I love the photographs. Like one of the really fun things about being an author and writing about the RAF and the war is being able to pick through the photographs and choosing the super cool photographs that go in your book. Um, it's great. And the quality of the photographs you, sh you see in the archives down in Canberra is indicative of the degree of media attention of your squadron. Okay? 75 squadron, Port Moresby 42, no one ever photographed that unit. And it's so not my story now, but if there was ever a unit that's been hard done by in terms of non-recognition, the granting of no gongs, just shut up. You know, you've saved you've saved the bacon for the whole campaign, but just piss off out of here. You know, that's seventy-five squadron. It's a, you know, not photographed. This unit was photographed and photographed and photographed. It's a glamour unit. So they start off with five confirmed kills in one combat. Alan Boyd, who'd never been in combat before, hadn't even been through a fighter OTU, was credited four of those yeah it's only second operational flight are you like how credible do you think this is this is just on 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 that basis the kills came in threes and twos these are the pilots of that great combat where the five kills in one combat rawlinson parrot pelly and the highly credited boyd reality check if you know anything about my books you know the rampant overclaiming of the air force in the second world war is just one of the never-ending stories of air campaigns. So confirmed kills, 16. Actual results, five. So three to one overclaiming ratio, that's about normal for our Air Force at that stage of the, year, uh, of the war. Remember, the Italians were worse, the Japanese were worse. Germans, better in terms of accuracy. Okay, And in order to achieve those results, we lost six aircraft actually shot down with three pilots killed and one pilot wounded, 12.7 millimeter explosive bullet in the hand. So um, he was out of action. He um, is a blighty wound. He gets repatriated ultimately to Australia. That's uh, Lex Winton, and he actually gets to fly with 75 in the Port Moresby campaign once he gets finally patched up. Yeah, look, I'm just pointing out, you know, Christopher Shaw's 
is like an absolute authority. He's committed his entire life to researching these campaigns. And so if I'm saying that only that number of aircraft is it's destroyed, it's because I read Christopher Shaw's. Okay, I, 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 and nobody has ever been able to come up with evidence to the contrary. There have been plenty of opportunities. Three black days uh, under with gladiators against the Italians. So on the 19th of November, bounced by CR-42s, squadron leader Peter Heath is shot down and killed. So he is the CO graduate. He's supposed to take over. He's dead in his first operational flight, bounced and killed. Okay, this, this shook the squadron so much that the headquarters pulled it out of the line for two weeks to regroup. It was a shocking experience. So they went back into the line, and then on the 13th of December, once again, bounced by CR-42s. Five gladiators shot down, four of them completely written off. But one of the flight commanders, Chaz Gaden, is killed. Okay? Once again, two weeks stand down, severe morale problems. The squadron starts to create a sort of bogey in its mind of the, the, the fearsome CR-42. They ascribe to the CR-42's hurricane-like performance of like 300 mile per hour top speeds. The reason is, of course, that if the other guy's bouncing you, he's always going to appear faster, isn't he? Because you're, you're lower, you're slower, and you're turning, losing more speed. He's going to seem real quick as he flashes past you and then pulls up for his next firing run. But it gives you an impression that he's a fast aircraft. And then on the 25th of January, they're bounced by G-50s, and pilot officer Jimmy Campbell is killed. Um, straight after that, again, HQ realised that the squadron's morale was suffering and they converted them to hurricanes. So hurricane totally transforms the story. We know that ultimately in the, in the desert campaign, these things get shot down in droves by Messerschmitts, but in the early 41 period, this aircraft is well good enough. So they get 36 confirmed kills um, just in a few short months. And look at the claiming ratio, the overclaiming ratio, it's very minor now. So um, they're claiming three and two is the correct number. So the overclaiming is nowhere near as bad. They're all German, all their kills. So it's a harder enemy now. They're still shooting them down and they're mostly bombers. They're doing the job that a fighter squadron should do. Four Hurricanes are lost. They're shot down by 110s and JU-87 front guns. So in the course of a confusing low level, because if you take on JU-87s, they die for the dirt, they split up and they go everywhere. That's German doctrine. And so the hurricanes are going to get down really low and go after them and there's a dust haze. It's a confused mess down there and a low visibility mess. So in the course of that, some German JU-87 driver is able to get in behind a hurricane, shoot him down. Incredible. I never knew that such a thing could happen because I'd read all the Battle of Britain propaganda against the Stuka, which proves to be a bit exaggerated. Uh, two pilots killed. One is a POW and white. one is a psychiatric casualty. He goes down in flames, goes in the psychiatric hospital, sent back to the squadron, goes into another fight and sees his mate go down in flames, killed. Breaks up. Like he, again, evacuated to a psychiatric hospital. Okay. The so the hurricanes a period, it's a good period for the squadron. The gladiator period was difficult, steep learning curve, particularly you know when you think about that low level of experience and expertise. So look at look at the leaders who are killed in in gladiators. Uh, Peter Heath, he was squadron, he was to be the next CO, uh, a flight commander, another flight commander, and then another flight commander and another CO designate. The, the squadron CO um, should have been this guy, but he gets, gets himself killed. Uh, it's in his first combat. Yeah, it's in a hurricane. Look, I've, I've, I've read a lot that's uh, researched in the historical records of a lot of our fighter squadrons, and I've written up a lot of the stories. Let me tell you, the deaths are normally the sergeants and the pilot officers at the back of the formation. It's like the blue fours and the red threes. They're the guys who die. When you're getting flight commanders killed, things like one, that's a bad day. CO killed, really bad. So the fact that they're losing so many flight leaders is indicative of a very, very difficult campaign with some very adverse results. 
So this is clearly a unit which is on a steep learning curve. You can see the leaders are leading from the front because they're getting killed doing so. And the fatalities in the gladiator period, it's almost all leaders, no boggies, just one boggy gets killed in this period, right? Unusual as a distribution. Yeah, if you did survive the gladiator days, you would survive to go back to Australia or to, or to go into another job. So all these guys went on to be COs in 42. So if you can just get through that hard apprenticeship on gladiators against the Italians, those first couple of months, you've learnt your trade and you'll survive. Well, you've got a very good chance of surviving. Okay, Syria, statistically, I, I just, I haven't understood why this would be so. The French, I'm not going to say they're incompetent, they weren't. Their aircraft, good aircraft. They knew this campaign was coming, they prepared for it. Look what happens to them, because three squadron virtually carries the entire air superiority campaign for the, for the RAF. Um, it is the fighter squadron. They obtained air superiority with three squadron. I mean, these are boutique campaigns so far. They're very small numbers of forces. Yeah, 43 confirmed kills. They actually destroyed 40 aircraft. Lots of fatalities in the French bomber crews. Lots of French bomber crews burned to death in their aircraft. It's a very, very sad story. But from the perspective of a fighter squadron, this is their finest hour. Look at the, the exchange ratio, 10 to 1. Even the Japanese in 1942 would have struggled. In fact, I don't think they came even really near close to a 10 to 1 kill ratio. To find a 10 to 1 kill, kill ratio, what's that? The Luftwaffe against um, um, I-15s in 1941? Like even for the fabled Luftwaffe, a 10 to 1 kill ratio is very difficult to achieve, rarely achieved. Nil pilot losses. So what are you going to say? You'd have to say this unit would finish Syria thinking, we're, you know, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. So they go to, back to the Western Desert. And unfortunately, by then, by then um, JG-27 has arrived with 109s. So in this period, 35 confirmed kills, 19 enemy aircraft actually destroyed. It's approximate. Can't be totally precise there. Three of those are Italian. The rest of them are German. Range of types. Much like the Battle of Britain, the sort of distribution of the, the types that they shoot down, 26 Tomahawks shot down, all by 109s, 16 pilots killed, three wounded. Now, you've got to say, that's a pretty hard campaign. And I can tell you, having crunched the numbers on those other campaigns that I cite there, because I've written books about them, this is the hardest campaign of any Australian fighter squadron ever, by a long shot. So let's do some comparisons. 452 over France in 41, 55 confirmed kills. I think the correct number is six actually shot down, but, you know, 10 is plausible. 18 Spitfire shot down, eight pilots killed, six POW. Right? Pretty hard campaign too, huh? But it was worse in three squadron against the Germans at the end of 41. 75, 18 confirmed kills, 70 actually destroyed in air combat, plus about a dozen strafing kills, of course. You've got to include that but um, I haven't. It, 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 16 Kitty shot down, 12 pilots KA. That's a hard campaign. That's a hard fighting unit. And what did I say about, I write about the years of adversity when it's difficult. Um, one fighter wing, three squadrons, not one, 70 confirmed kills, 30 actually shot down, 28 spits shot down, 14 pilots killed. You can see that three squadron, one squadron in three months, has lost more casualties than the three squadron force of one fighter wing over nine months. It's a fighting a squadron in the RAF. The reason I think that the Germans go through them so badly is that they've diluted the squadron with um, Article 15 graduates out of the first, like the first batch of OTU graduates from the Egypt um, OTU. So um, they've, they've repatriated a lot of tourist expired leaders, like there are some examples there. Pelly, Perrin, Rawlinson, Jackson, all head back to Australia. Like John Jackson, right? Would If he had stayed another three months with three squadron, would he have survived to command 75 squadron at Newton Port Moresby? I don't think so. I think he would have been killed. So 
the timing of the repatriation is very important because those guys missed that bad part of the campaign, the bad end of the campaign. Yeah, and so from this point on, once they get out of finished with Syria, they're treated as far as the pilot reinforcements are concerned, just like any other RAF squadron. So they get flooded with sergeants and pilot officers from uh, RAF OTUs. So you know that stuff about being a special squadron because you're a RAF regular squadron, you've got special dispensation for everything, that's over. From this point on, they're just taking on pilots, Australian, admittedly, they're Australian pilots from the OTUs, but they're, they're on the same basis as far as their, the training of the pilots is concerned as any other RAF squadrons. Yeah, and, and of those fatalities in this campaign, 13 of them were the new reinforcements. So once again, they're guys on a, they're low on the learning curve, they're suddenly fighting the most difficult enemy that anyone's ever fought, and they're dying, like in my other books, the sergeants and the pilot officers at the back end of the formation are getting shot off the formation. Yeah, arse and Charlie victims, victims, just like in an RAF squadron of the period. But junior leaders also get killed um, on this one day. I can't believe there's two flight commanders killed on the one day, 22nd of November. Remember the losses of flight commanders back in the gladiator days? It's happening again. Can you imagine the shock? that this unit suffered moving from the Syrian campaign where it's everything's gone their way back into the Western Desert fighting JG27 and having to deal with this. It does deal with it. Um, you've got to say about the Air Force, it's pretty bloody resilient. Um, um, they, they bounce back. That's a great photo. It's not a three squadron, but I think it encapsulates probably a bit of the the, the mess, um, the untidiness of the Western Desert, the, the sheer sloppiness that came from living in basically um, uh, vehicular caravans in the middle of the desert for weeks and months at a time. But also, I think you get some of the battle scarred sort of shock of landing and finding out who's still alive. So, yeah, the, the trouble with um, the time that Three Squadron was inserted into the Western Desert campaign was in, just in time for us to launch Operation Crusader where we kick uh, Robble um, uh, back out of Cyrenaica for a couple of months. And they keep on running into, like the Germans are putting in a maximum effort. That's the bad news for us. This operation on the ground is so important that Luftwaffe has got to go to maximum effort. And so their fighter unit has to generate a lot of sorties. We run into them, seven pilots lost in one day, nine Tomok shot down. Nothing like this happened to any other RAAF squadron. Yeah, pretty tough tour. So in the course of 40 to 41, 77 pilots flew with the unit. 20 were killed, four taken prisoner. 15 exited, two expired by the end of the year to be repatriated to Australia. In most cases, or to take over one of the newly created Australian fighter squadrons in the desert, like 450 or 451. Five pilots withdrawn from the unit prematurely after only flying a few operations. This is consistent with the pattern that I see across all the squadrons of, 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 of um, research. If a pilot is not coping, they don't charge him with LMF, like we've all heard of that. The MO, the CO or the flight commander will ask the MO to go and see the pilot and they'll talk about it medically and they'll get him out of the unit. No one will be talking about it. He'll just quietly leave the unit under some sort of medical reason. Okay, that's... That's what happens to them. And again, I've looked at a lot of units. That's that's what happens to them. So that they don't get ridiculed and all the stuff that some people write. Um, it must have happened, of course. I'm not saying it didn't happen sometime, somewhere. Uh, four were withdrawn from the unit, wounded. So all the rest, those lucky fellows, they get to finish their tour on Kitty Hawks in 1942. And the meat grinder goes on into 1942, but it's not the subject of my book. Interestingly, uh, yeah, what was the non-combat accident rate between the aircraft? I think there's a good comparison here. During the Gladiator era, only three Category 3 write-offs. So these are non, not, not, not combat related, just flying accidents. And six Cat 2 damaged. So that the Cat 2, they've got to go back to the depot to be repaired uh, above squadron level. Now, you've probably read um, the flight reviews of the Gladiator, uh, as I have. And it's one of those aircraft that wants to hunt its tail when it's on the ground. You know, so this is a ground looper, if there ever was. Gladiator is a great ground looper. 
But the squadron are really good at flying them and they don't crash them hardly at all. That's John Jackson's crash, by the way. So the squadron, having flown we're aways, converting to this, it's doable. They can fly this aircraft, they can fly it safely. They're low hours, but they're still safe with this aircraft. It tells you that the RAF was pretty good at training pilots to actually manipulate the control, I think. The Hurricane, two Cat 3 write-offs again, three Cat three, 2 damage. Like, I think that's remarkable when you think about the crap airfields these guys are operating out of. All the bad conditions, the tiredness, the dust hazes, all the stuff that would appear in an accident report if we we're writing today. But that is an excellent uh, re record. And certainly you can see that this aircraft is good to fly. It's got a lot more power than the Gladiator, but they don't crash them. So flying Gladiator is a perfectly good, you know, uh, preparation for flying a Hurricane. This is a nice flying airplane, quite clearly. Uh, it doesn't want to swap ends on the ground. So inexperienced pilot. But the Tomahawk, what's going on here? Two-month training period before Syria. 27 aircraft delivered to the unit. One of them is Cat 3, right off the pilot's killed. 16 have to go back to the damage, but go back to the depot damaged. That's with the undercarriage wiped off, the prop busted, a wing tip typically broken, so you've got to replace the whole wing. You know, P-40s, it's, the wing is one section, and then you lift the uh, fuselage down onto the wing. You know, it's, it's unlike a Spitfire where you take the wings off separately. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's remarkable. That, that, that it could be that. because you read again you read flight reviews of this aircraft and it's it's got a good p40 is a good good flying aircraft it's not as, not as if they've got a nasty stall or anything like that they they seem to be a pretty good aircraft but somehow or other i'm wondering whether it's because it's an american aircraft like british aircraft of the period as we know you you, you three point them and if you don't you'll be criticized by your flight commander and probably jeered at a little bit by all your fellow pilots american aircraft you two wheel them. And, you know, I wonder whether they're just trying to fly an American aircraft like a British aircraft. And um, they're trying to three point it and then it ground loops and the rest is history. It makes sense. Yeah. Look, I'm not saying I've got to the bottom of this, but I'm just, I'm just noticing the numerical pattern. Yeah. Yeah. The, as we know, the campaign proved ultimately to be successful. So, Three Squadron was associated or involved in a very successful campaign. Even when we were losing hurricanes and tomahawks out of hand, we, we still had air superiority. We never lose air superiority. And the extent of the air superiority increases over time. The secret source is the maintenance. So if you're going to be good at, as an air force, you've got to have a hell of a mechanical um, uh, backup. And that's what they did. So they were in theatre um, re repair and salvage units and aircraft depots. So aircraft which were damaged, or um, you know, suffered an unserviceable aircraft with a you know uh, engine, needs an engine replacement. It's broke, broken up, transported to the rear, and back in Egypt, there's a it's it's not my words a complete air force. There's a complete air force back in Egypt. They've got everything. They can fabricate parts. They can modify aircraft. There are aviation uh, firms. It's a bit like the Brisbane area when the Americans got here. If you think of all of the uh, technical backup that they're able to get from the RAF, as well as from private firms, from Qantas and so on and so forth. Think about that. Egypt was like that, but, but more so. The RAF had configured the ground echelons in back in uh, the canal zone, as they called it, to do everything. And so back there, they could fix any aircraft, rebuild any aircraft, refurbish anything, and then send it back to the unit brand new. That's while well, we won the campaign, because with this behind us, we could always put out more sorties. By far, we did it against the Italians, we did it against the Germans, did it against the French. More sorties, more often, more aircraft over in the operational area. The enemy will be able to do it as a spurt, and then they'll, their, their sortie rate will drop off because the maintenance um, deficit that they collect while operating will become too hard for them. Now, this is a good example of our superior maintenance backup. Air filters, um, dust air filters, they're Vokes air filters. Just like every other British aircraft, Spitfires, Hurricanes, they all had it. So gladiators arrive in the Middle East with these things fitted or the depots back in Egypt fit them once they've arrived in Egypt. 
So no aircraft will go to the front without a Vokes air filter. As we know, if you don't have those, the carburetor sucks in all the dust and it wears away your, your piston rings and so on and so forth. You lose compression, you start going through oil, then you can't deliver your power. Ultimately, the oil loss becomes so bad, as the Italians find out, you do a flight, you've got a sortie, so you, 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 you scramble or whatever with the rest of your squadron, and then you run out of oil, because as you know, you've got an oil total loss system in World War II uh, piston engines, run out of oil halfway through the, the mission, have to turn the engine off and force land in the desert somewhere. That's what the Italians had to do all the time. They deploy all their fighter squadrons without, air, without the um, dust filter. That one's got it because that photograph would have been taken in 40, um, later in 41. But get this, the Italians have been in Libya since 1920 something. They've had an air force deployed there for, since 1920 something. They've been expecting the war. Mussolini's been talking about the war. So they've had all this time in theatre to notice the effect of the dust being ingested through aero engines. And they start the campaign without any dust filters on their engines. This means that Italian aircraft get 10 or 20 hours before the engine is out of hours, basically. 10 or 20 flying hours. So just think about what that does to the sortie output of the Italian Air Force. And worse, the Italian system was, so the aircraft goes on surface. Let's say it's a case like I just said. The engine's going through so much oil that they can't use it anymore. The aircraft's de declared unserviceable. They leave it sitting there on, the, on that airfield until someone eventually will organise for it to be shipped away to Italy, back to the factory to be rebuilt. Think of it. You've got your, your fighter group. You might have 30 aircraft. One week, you 10 of them. Hang of princesses spread around, parked around the airfield. Next week, you've got 20. Next week, you get 30. You get some new planes arrive. You might get 10 new planes. You know, by week five, you've got 40 aircraft clogging up the airfield, none of them serviceable, all waiting to be taken back to Italy to be rebuilt at the factory. What was the RAF doing? You fly it back to Egypt before it gets too bad that you can't fly it. It might be out of hours, but you'll still ferry it by air back to Egypt. It'll be rebuilt there and sent back to the squadron in a couple of months' time. The other secret trail success was vehicular mobility. We had a shitload of vehicles, pardon my French. So 30, number three had 37 vehicles. That's in 1941. They would have had more in 1942. The structure, this was across RAF Middle East, two echelons. Okay, so let's say you're advancing. There's your base. You receive orders that you're going to be moving to a forward airfield. Second echelon will move to the forwarding air airfield. You're still operating for the original base. When they're ready, you fly the planes in to the new base. The first echelon get into their trucks, pack everything up and join them. They arrive there and the signals just come through from HQ. They want the squadron to move further. Second echelon, leapfrogs. Okay, when they're ready, they fly the planes in. And then they do that when we retreat as well. Three squadron in the course of that, I would say it's almost a calamitous retreat when Rommel chased us out of Cyrenaica um, in early 42, you know, leading into the siege of Tobruk. Three squadron lost two aircraft left behind on the ground. In both cases, the pilot had to force land because of a technical issue of some sort. He gets on the ground and the army's sort of racing past him in trucks and the guys are yelling out, Get a move on, mate. Don't leave it there. Rommel's just behind us. This is pretty well the situation. And the pilot goes, oh, shit, okay. Um, I better burn my aircraft and then get in one of those trucks and get back to my base. That's what happened twice. Funnily enough, in one case, meanwhile, the squadron, it, it told them where, where it was forced landing and the squadron sent a servicing party and they arrive, they arrive at this base. They see the burnt out hurricane. No sign of the pilot. And Rommel's nowhere to be seen. <laughs> so, um, but two, losing two aircraft only in such a, um, you know, a topsy turvy kind of a retreat is indicative of good organization. Um, and it means we're able to supply the army with air cover both during advances and during retreats. And the whole RAF loses very, very, very few aircraft on the ground during our retreats. You've got to give it to them. 
the classic, yeah, it, the, the, the opposite is true of the Regia, Regia Aeronautica. It's a picture of a G50. You can see it's a bit, um, the tail is damaged. There's hurricanes. So the RAF has arrived and it's operating from the base. But the story of our advance, that's the, the advance which um, General O'Connor um, uh, engineered, uh, where we, uh, the, the first Cyrenaican offensive, by the time we got all the way to the borders of Trip Trip Tripolitania, 1,200 Italian aircraft had left behind, been left behind on their airfields, just sitting on airfields. Only 58 were shot down by the RAF in the course of the entire campaign. So why did we win? We win, one, because we had the technical backup, deep technical backup, to continue operating continuously, even when the ground situation was moving chaotically. And I don't know about leaving nobody behind, but certainly never leave an aircraft behind, a culture of never leaving an aircraft behind. There were exceptions, obviously, but the difference between this system and this result on the part of our Air Force compared with that of the Italians is obviously very, very stark. Now, the Germans obviously aren't the Italians, but the Germans also struggled to provide the sort of technical backup the RAF could do. And so we outdo them. We've got worse aircraft, we've got worse trained air crew, uh, certainly our fighter pilots. Uh, with loss rates like the ones we saw before, it's a bit hard to see how you could get really good as a squadron, how you could get really sharp when you're losing flight commanders and all kinds of people at that kind of rate. It means you're always going to be playing catch up with your training. But so, yeah, OK, the, the Germans certainly shot more of us down than we shot down of them when the 109s arrived. But even so, we beat them on sortie rate. So ultimately, when the, we, went, we won the war because we could build airfields, we could build air, air depots, we built trucks, we built trailers, we built, you name it, every, every uh, form of backup. And three squadron was able to ride on the back of that excellence. Yeah, and we're finished. we'll finish there. Three squadron was often the last to leave in those retreats. They were, um, they were fighting their way out as well as, uh, as retreating. Now, that's not strictly true for an Air Force, but they were capable of fighting well, as the, they were retreating. Yeah, the Air Force was really frustrated with the Army in this period. In, yeah, so, incredibly frustrated with the Army. Yeah. Um, I guess they weren't really thinking about it from the Army's perspective, but yeah, they got so cocky that they would talk as though they should let... If only let them deal with Rommel, you know, they would, like, like, it's, it's, it's like the Air Force thought that they could go out into the desert in vehicles and like there was a cockiness mm -hmm. to the Air Force. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it must have been frustrating for them um, to have to abandon those bases. Yeah. And from their perspective, each time it's for no reason, you know, that's the way they see it, but well, they do it. One of the other things in the story you talked about, uh, logistics and uh, support back from Egypt. I, I researched the Blitz truck in uh, North Africa and I got some good photographs of three squadrons in the Blitz truck. We've got one in our museum. So I was trying to find some stories and I came across a, a unit in Egypt manned by the RAAF, uh, RAAF flight lieutenant who just basically ran convoys, a, a, you know, like a dozen Blitz truck convoys constantly I think it was in the era of three squadron and 450 squadron. Yeah, what was he doing with this convoy? It was just total, it was a RAF resupply convoy. Resupply. Uh, constantly backwards and forwards yeah. to the squadron yeah. wherever yeah. it was. Of course, the other thing about the campaign is the army supplies the air force up to um, like the rear supply bases. And then the air force have got a lot of vehicles. Yeah, they've got a lot of vehicles, all right. Mm. But they don't have the ability that the army has to bring the the um you know the bulk commodities from the canal zone let's say as far forward as Mirza Matru and so those air force supply convoys yep. the units are sending them back to a dump which the army has put there for the air force so yeah. there's times when the air force has got to acknowledge that the army did something yeah so I like the idea of the, that RAF convoy just setting out across the yeah. desert to find their squadron yeah they're not, they weren't going to give their stuff to anybody else you know, yeah they, they were there yeah the recent well i mean with a focus a, a really good supply story is the, the the excellence of the supply is the beer supply like this was a squadron where the pirates would drink two tallies a day they would also that was, that was 
enemy hacks and use it as a beer truck back yeah. to Egypt. <laughs> but they they didn't need the enemy hack. Like yeah. I'm just astounded that in the midst of a campaign where a lot of things are short, like they're running out of aircraft, they're running out of fuel, they're running out of you know, lots of things that they don't really have enough of in 1941. But three squadrons, they can each pilot can drink two tallies per night. And if they don't, it's a beer shortage. And what they mean by beer shortage is one tallie. Yeah. You know, so, and it's Australian beer. So there they are in the middle of the desert. They're drinking Australian beer and they're complaining when the supply drops sufficiently. That, that literally, three squadrons wet mess would sell it to the other RAF units. So the RAF units would come around to get cases of Australian beer. And you knew it was a beer crisis at three squadron when it was shut up shop to the other to the RAF units and the RAF units couldn't buy it in bulk. Like my Western Desert story is in winter. So yeah, I think it's about 15 degrees. The beer's going, they're going to be drinking at 15 degrees. But in the in the summer, yeah, they're, they're drinking like 35 degree beer. So one of the stories I know from North Queensland anyway was load the um, beer into an aircraft, take yeah. it up, yeah. fly around yeah. for about Bomber. half an hour or yeah. so. Three squadron wouldn't have been able to do that because yeah. yeah, they just didn't yeah. have the aircraft. You need bombers to do that. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd heard well, one of the things they called three squadron was the Clifty Squadron. You were Clifty. Familiar, no. You know, well, uh, that's probably from the second half that, of the war. That, that, yeah, but that meant that they, they used to lift everything and pitch oh. it all. Well, they, I was just wondering, you know, that's how they got so much, how much, now they had so much transport because they used to steal it off of all yeah, well, the other units. They, they, they could, that obviously would have happened in the Western Desert, like lots of units would have done that, but they definitely got fitted out really well by RAF Middle East, um, fair's fair. Um, yeah, um, as far as lifting is concerned, like they, they had a, during, during the retreat, they had a, a tender breakdown, the ditch, you know, the whole it would have been jarring upon bad roads and the, the, the chassis would have broken. And so that this tender was left and it was the HQ, like the squadron HQ tender. It had the unit's records. It had the mess beer for the officer's mess and it had the officer's mess records in it. And so they had to leave it behind. They got to the base and then they sent um, a, an officer in a small caravan back against the flow of the retreating traffic to recover in, in order of importance. Yeah. Mess records uh, were the last because everyone wanted them to be destroyed so you wouldn't have to ever pay your mess bill. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> so they, they wanted the beer, you know, primarily. They get there and the army, of course, has been the Australian army, <laughs> the Ninth Division, has been driving past this position all day and shit is everywhere. All the officers' kit, is like blowing in the wind. The the beer's gone. Actually, obviously, the only thing they got back with was the officers' mess records. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, stealing worked in lots of ways. An associated story was one of the, yeah, you know, th th that time we had uh, uh, enlisted pilots, sergeant pilots, and mm -hmm. aircrew pilots. But didn't they form a combined mess? Was Eventually, that the whole Desert Air Force did. Yeah, yeah, it was it was already being done by the RAF, like 14 Squadron, a bomber squadron. They were doing that pretty early in 41, really quite early. So before three squadron did it, it's often told that it was an Australianism, okay. but it wasn't. It's an RAFism. Just a bit of a historical one. Um, in Syria, they were fighting the French. What French were they? Oh, Vichy. Uh, yeah, okay. So the Vichy, the Vichy government was... Um, um, not exactly, they hadn't declared war against one another. The British Empire and the Vichy government hadn't declared war against one another, but they, like the French conducted bombing raids against, you know, at times, um, periodically. Um, so there was combat, you know, from time to time. And then the invasion of Syria, um, obviously it was to um, ensure that there was allied control of the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean. Yeah, um, but more than that, because they were worried about um, the access getting into the ore fields in, in Iraq. And and so controlling Syria was a way of preventing any access, access to the ore fields in Iraq. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why they did it. Um, 
particularly as the Syrian uh, government had in fact let Axis aircraft through on their way to Iraq. Uh, you know, so I, I think they had a, an open and shut case why it was fair to invade the place, um, but unfortunate, particularly, you know, considering the number of French airmen who died through um, meeting three squadron in the air. Yeah. Of all people to be dying in large numbers, like they didn't shoot down a single Italian bomber, like three squadron. Not one Italian bomber crew was killed by three squadron. But but then these poor French. To link in with the comment about the Vichy French, it wasn't about the same time that the Royal Navy attacked the the uh, French Navy when they were still Vichy controlled. Because that was the... back in 1940. Oh, 40, yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 Anybody got any questions online? Oh, I've got a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm James Oglethorpe. I'm from the Three Squadron Association in Sydney. So, firstly, Anthony, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Really enjoyed it. Do you know how you cool beer in 50 degrees Celsius temperatures? <laughs> um, no, I don't. Um, you pour some 100 octane in the sand and you yeah. bury the bottles in the sand. And about 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about our forces in the desert. They had a lot of fuel. They could use it for a lot of um, frivolous purposes. So that's an example. Yeah. Because the oil fields are just next door, right? So um, the Commonwealth forces in the desert were never going to run out of fuel unless there was a problem with trucks. I have a question. Go um, ahead. Bruce Bailey's my name. My dad served in three squadron in North Africa and in, in the Lebanon Syria campaign. Look, an excellent lecture. It's It's been really wonderful. Thank you very much for all the work you've done. I'm really interested in the medical air evacuation role, which I still believe Three Squadron carries out of Richmond here in Australia. And it's an area I'd like to learn more about. So um, uh, that's what my dad, my dad was a first year medical student. He, he wasn't a, a pilot. Um, but I understand that was an important role of Three Squadron. You mean the air ambulance? Um, well, air ambulance or just evacuation of wounded troops or injured, injured that because yeah. you guys were always near the front, the three squadron were always close to the action. Yeah, well, obviously, as a fighter squadron, um, they're just flat out doing what they're supposed to be doing as a fighter yeah. squadron. But but as we know, um, the RAF, RWF um, air ambulance unit was there, number one, yeah. with the H86s and um, some other aircraft. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the go-to unit for uh, airborne evacuation in the campaign. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. One, Thank one you air. for your lecture. Um, Anthony James again. Uh, just the, uh, the attrition rate of the Tomahawks in Syria. Uh, the story goes that the aircraft arrived over the you know, long-distance route from Africa um, without any documentation of any sort at all. And, and also there were uh, no skilled pilots to tell the, the people who were converting um, any of the finer details about landing the aircraft in particular. Uh, and apparently a lot of the landing accidents were down to hitting the, the tarmac too, too hard uh, because it was, in many cases, the first tarmac runways that anybody operated on uh, when they were training in Palestine. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the ground crews yeah. in... Sorry, the ground crews in three squadron uh, kept a tally, and I think they uh, the number of tomahawks they rode off in landing accidents they only exceeded victories over the French on about the last day of the campaign in Syria. So finally, they they were showing a positive tally. Only they were square, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a bit exaggerated about the no help from the manufacturer because, um, you know, the squadron records talk about you know um, a representative from Curtis Wright arriving at the squadron to instruct the ground crew. And they're also um, US Army Air Corps pilots. Um, they had a little military mission there in Egypt. And um, the aircraft Tomahawks mostly arrived by sea, through the Red Sea. Um, so um, hurricanes typically in Blenheim came across the Takaradi route. Um, but they got a lot of Tomahawks straight out of the, um, uh, the packing cases um, in, in the ports. But they had technical help from Curtis Wright as well as from some pilots from the US Army Air Corps. Because um, the squadron records, sometimes they name them, sometimes they don't, but they sort of appear. And um, when there's, you know, during that, that spate of accidents, they refer to, you know, the experts. So 
yet, I mean, certainly all of our all of our units would have needed to have done it mostly themselves, but there was some in theatre technical support for sure. Any more for any more? Good evening, Lee Ryan from uh, Melbourne. Um, I'm interested in the change of designation of the unit from a uh, Army Corporation to fighter. Um, the ORB refers to an organisation or MEMO instructing them to change the internal organisation of the unit from a three-flight unit to a two-flight unit, reflecting the fact that the two-flight unit would be a fighter unit as against the three-flight unit, which was an air, uh, air, um, Army Cooperation unit. Now, later in the war, Army Cooperation units get redesignated tactical reconnaissance. And that organization exists right through to um, the end of the war. So when we talk about a fighter squadron, we've got to acknowledge that initially three squadron was an Army Cooperation unit, and that was its role. The fact that they were defending some of the guys lower down doing the tactical reconnaissance stuff, they had to have somebody sitting up uh, at an altitude to defend them from marauding uh, uh, Axis fighters. So we, we need to be careful about the, the definitions of fighters versus army cooperation. The, the thing Comments? is, in the Middle East, it's a bit of an organisational mess and they're yep. changing things on the run, you know, and so what doctrine said and what they did, what a table of organisations said, what they had, they were making a lot, like they were they were inventing a whole new way of operation in real time. And so I don't think we can really be too hung up on nuances like that because it's it's a moving feast. And as far as the Army Cooperation role of three squadrons concerned, they abandoned that pretty well from the first operation. The first couple of operations were a tactical reconnaissance with, a, with an escort. But after that, they're just talking about fight operations. They're doing fighter sweeps, uh, defensive fighter sweeps mostly, um, because the Hurricanes are doing the offensive fighter sweeps. It's quite World War One-ish um, in terms of talking in terms of offensive fight, offensive sweeps and defensive uh, and, and offensive and defensive. Um, so you know what you've got to judge the unit by what it's actually doing, what missions it's really being assigned. And what it's really being assigned, irrespective of any nicety of an official designation, is it's a fighter squadron. Um, it happens really quickly, like within weeks. And the pretty well, uh, you know, I, I agree. I mean, they still have an army support role, but then so does all of the Western Desert Air Force. The bomber squadrons are doing that as well. The hurricane squadrons, like the whole, it's, it's a, the thing about the RAF in the Middle East is it's truly joint. It's unlike the rest of the RAF. I mean, the, as we know, Bomber Command runs its own show. Fighter Command runs its own show. The RAF Middle East was a joint operation. All the officers, well, certainly the important officers, they really understood that. And so um, the RAF was able to operate, luckily, um, in, the, in the Western Desert, free of the kind of doctrinal niceties, the hang-ups that they had, the Metropolitan Air Force had back in England, and they were able to invent doctrine on the run. They were able to ignore the niceties of what it was supposed to be like. A good example of ignoring niceties is they invent the, reinvent the squadron as the fighter squadron, and then the Air Board in Melbourne, which is supposed to be running, is supposed to be ultimately responsible for the direction of the squadron, the Air Board in Melbourne just has to catch up and they don't have the um, influence to change the facts on the ground. The facts on the ground were changed by Air Marshal Longmore and by the squadron officers. Um, Blamey was involved. So it's a joint decision, a joint service decision to reconfigure this squadron as a fighter squadron. Sure, in support of the army, but like I say, uh, Western Desert Air Force, it's all in support of the Army. That's what they're for. It's a tactical air force before the term gets coined. Um, you know, one of the great things about this campaign is how joint it is. And I speak as an Air Force historian 
who's read or who's, who's written campaigns where it's the RAF doing things for itself, for its own purposes, running its private campaign. Um, it's refreshing in this campaign to see the Air Force acting as a joint component of our battle-winning team. I find it really refreshing. And so changing up the doctrine is happening all the time because they're making it work, they're making it work on the spot, they're successful. I just wish more of the thinking, the RAF thinking in Egypt, in RAF Middle East, could have influenced the thinking back in, in Britain. Because, you know, like the bomber offensive, for example, um, would that really pass muster using the kind of thinking, the joint thinking that Air Force officers are using in RAF Middle East? I wonder. It's obviously a pretty pointless hypothetical, but um, uh, what I can say is that it's very refreshing as an Air Force historian to see the Air Force being truly joint, truly supporting the Army, really caring about supporting the Army, um, and trying to win the combined campaign. Because what they're trying to do is they're not trying to just win their air combats as some sort of private Air Force versus Air Force thing. They're trying to win the whole bloody campaign. They want the Army to be successful and to drive Rommel out of Cyrenaica. Um, and okay, we know that you know, it didn't work that, that well, uh, but that's not the Air Force's fault. The Air Force did everything it needed to do to support the Army. It's just that the Army found it difficult to win those battles in 1941 and 1942 for a bunch of reasons, which we obviously don't have time to go into now, but it's not the Air Force's fault. The Air Force was being admirably joint. I think it's great. And it reflects what the ADF is about now, right? Um, I used to be in the Air Force, you know, and I observed the ADF from a distance. Uh, and you can see the way that the Air Force now is genuinely joint, a way that's refreshing, way more joint than it was when I was in. Um, and three squadrons like a um, forerunner of this whole approach. So, um, yeah, I Thank really you. love this unit for a whole bunch of reasons. <laughs> that's one of them. Uh, September 1986, 70th anniversary of Three Squadron dining in. Uh, I get invited for my own reasons, sitting down the back of the dining in with all the um, the plebs and some air crew and whatnot. We all get uh, given a crock of port, Three Squadron port. Mine's, uh, and they're numbered, mine's number 18. Different story. <clears throat> And uh, we all start conversation, talking to people around the place. Oh, what's your number? What's your number? Uh, old gentleman across the table from, from me. Oh, we didn't know who he was. Uh, what's your number? Uh, 42. What's the significance of that? Oh, I was the CO of the squadron in 1942. Goodness. I can't remember anything else after no. that. We got so drunk <laughs> on the... On the stories and the good time, I don't know who he was, but in September 86, I'd love to know who that gentleman was. Bobby Gibbs would fit the, fit the time frame, but... The, the gentleman who asked about medical evacuation uh, and mixed up with three squadron might have been thinking about number three, Aero Medical Evacuation Squadron. So it's just mixed up with that terminology. But in the RAF, the current organisation is number three, Aero Medical Evacuation Squadron. They shouldn't have used that number plate. No. <laughs> All right, everybody. I think we've had a, a, a long enough go at this one. Thanks, everybody, on Zoom land out there. I hope you enjoyed it all. And my apologies for forgetting to remind you to turn your phones off sound off and leaving mine on. Thanks, Anthony. Much appreciated. Thank you.